-hmm. And brand is really uh, the most important or a really critical element of disruptive innovation that's mm -hmm. successful. Because a brand has to do three things. It has to uh, position the subcategory. It has to sc help scale the subcategory mm -hmm. by creating a lot of awareness and attention and energy. And third, it has to build barriers mm -hmm. by branding innovations, by uh, you know, it, uh, creating a customer base and so on. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the first one, it has to position the subcategory. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it has to really basically tell people what's important in this new subcategory. What are the must-haves? What are the two or three things you have to do? So that means when customers are going to research the subcategory, they're going to use the positioning that the exemplar brand has made, which is they're going to say, well, I know that these two or three things are the most important things in these new subcategories. That's what I'm going to look for. Fellows, welcome to the next episode of Jagged with Jasravi, Conversations at the Edge with thought leaders from the marketing, branding, and the business world. And today, I am thrilled as all of you would be, we have the David Acker on our show. Hi, David. It's an honor. And I personally am a huge fan. Well, good. Thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, the father of branding needs no introduction, and this is like this can be taken literally. 22 years back in my post graduation, I'd come from engineering. I got introduced to the concept of a brand through your book. It was a text, you know, it was a textbook compulsory reading, which was building strong brands. And today, uh, you know, this is divine intervention for me that you are there on my show. And I am curious to know what sparked your interest in brands. Well, um, yeah, it was really a turning point in my career. I was teaching strategy. We're going way back to the, the mid 80s. That's 35 years ago. We, uh, I was teaching strategy and I became to believe that uh, corporations and, and executives were too focused on short-term measures, short-term financials. And, and I felt they needed to build assets instead to have long-term success. And so, uh, uh, I, uh, so the question is, how can I contribute to this, uh, uh, to this objective? And uh, I did a study in which I asked people, what, what are your, um, your sustainable competitive advantages? Because again, I, I wrote a book on strat business strategy and I was, uh, I, I was teaching it. And, uh, and the, the answer was there's about 40 or 50 responses. I mean, uh, different dimensions. Uh, I asked uh, three or 400 executives this question and, and, uh, the number one was uh, perceived quality of their product or offering. The number three was uh, brand recognition. And number 10 was a loyalty of their customer base. So three of the top 10 were, uh, were brand oriented. And besides that, I had written a book on advertising and uh, was very interested in, in uh, brand image. I'd written a book on marketing research, so I was very interested in, in the tools and techniques to find out about the marketplace. And I'd written a book on strategy, so I was very, uh, I was sort of up to date in business strategy. And so all those things sort of came together because uh, when you when you talk about the brand as an asset, then then all those tools are applicable. So I was kind of. 50% there already. And uh, so I wrote my first book called Managing Brand Equity. And what that book did was define this new emerging concept of brand equity. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, was, it was kind of a hot topic because companies were frustrated with their inability to grow. And the, uh, and the fact that 
reducing costs, had, had, which was the popular strategic move the day of the day, to have a cost advantage, so you move up the experience curve and so on. And, uh, and that was really had run its course. Mm. They found that they were at, sort of at a dead end. And they needed to build a build their brand and, and grow around that. So there's a lot of interest, but nobody had defined it. Mm-hmm. So I wrote this book that defined what brand equity was, and uh, and and uh, and I not only defined it, but I told about how things like brand awareness, what what are the the six or seven things that that gives you in the marketplace. And I did the same thing for brand image, and I did the same thing for brand loyalty. And uh, so, uh, so people could not only understand what it was, but why it was so strategically valuable. And then, uh, yeah. and then uh, that book became a, a a huge seller in the in the in the management world. And so, but then the question was, okay, I buy that. So how do you manage it? And that's when I wrote the book, Building Strong Brands, and introduced the brand identity model, mm-hmm. and uh, which I now call the brand vision model. Vision but model. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, that sort of provided a roadmap about how you, how you manage brands. Yes. Thank you, David. Uh, and, and there has also been uh, this book, Akar on Branding, The 20 Principles, that kind of uh, you know summarizes all that you've been uh, writing and taking the entire philosophy of brands forward and updating it. So I I've just bought that book. <laughs> I have homework for some days. Yeah, the, the yeah. reason I wrote that book is I had by this time seven or eight books that were on branding or relevant to branding, and uh, and I'd written three hundred blogs and I'd written about a dozen articles and. Uh, People came to ask me and said, you know, this is 2,300 pages of books. Which one should I read? Mm. And uh, it was hard to give an answer to that. So what I used to do for the new employees at, at Profit, Profit, where I'm associated with, yes. I, I, I used to go through each book and say, well, you should read these 50 pages, these 20 <laughs> pages. And I did this for every book. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and I, that wasn't very satisfactory. Nobody ever followed those uh, <laughs> that advice. Yeah. So I, I decided I needed a compact summary of everything that was that that people, uh, especially the new employees at Profit, could read and understand uh, the sort of IP that I had generated. <laughs> and uh, so that that's where Akron branding came from. Yeah. So David, now uh, today, today in this uh, digitally disrupted world, in this uh, pandemic affected world, we are witnessing so many fundamental changes in consumer behavior. Uh, the relationship that a consumer has with a brand and the role that a brand plays in an organization in that context, David, what would you say has changed and what will not change? Well, I uh, I wrote a uh, uh, a book describing what I thought was the key to the uh, dynamics in the marketplace that we're seeing. It was called Brand Relevance. It was a very a huge book, and uh, and what I said in that book was that that understanding the dynamics of the market is all about being relevant for a brand, and so. Uh, what happens is when a new subcategory emerges, uh, not only does that provide a growth opportunity for for some brands, it also provides a great threat for others. And uh, it, you could be, you know, you could make the the best minivan in the world, and uh, people would love your minivan. Mm-hmm. And they would never buy any other. They would tell all their neighbors and friends that your brand was the best. Mm-hmm. But if they're no longer interested in minivans, if they're going to buy an SUV, it doesn't matter how much they love your minivan. Mm-hmm. So you, you, uh, it, it only matters if you make an SUV and if they believe you're going to be good at that. So, 
their love for your minivan mean they they stronger than ever. But it it it's they you, you it's it doesn't matter how relevant you are for minivans if they're not buying them. Yes. So you have to understand the dynamics and the new subcategories that are emerging and be relevant for those. So I really changed the uh, my long developed uh, definition of brand equity, which is awareness of Im image and and uh, loyalty, to uh, to say that it's not only awareness. You have to you have to be credibility. You have to have credibility. Mm -hmm. So they have to believe that you can actually make SUVs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how you become relevant. That's what relevance is. It's not only visibility, but it's also credibility. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, uh, so that was one thing. And then the brand relevance book that there was so many, uh, so much confusion of what the word relevance was. Mm -hmm. And so my idea of new subcategories never caught on. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a, a new book, the, my most recent book called Owning Game-Changing Subcategories to, to really reposition this whole concept around subcategories. And the only way to grow is to create new subcategories and so on. Right. So David, in that book, um, if, we, if we, now there's a segue, let's get into that first. You've said that this is the way, uh, this is in the digital age, that's the best way uh, to grow. Uh, more than what organizations have been focusing on, which is creating a brand preference. So why is that, David? Would you elaborate a little on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, like I, studied, I, started, I started off studying the beer data in Japan. I, I spent a lot of time in Japan. I've been there 40 times. I was an uh, executive advisor to Dentsu for a long time. Um, so I got a hold of beer data and I looked at the beer data in Japan and, and over 30 years, there was only four times the market share trajectory changed despite enormous new product work, enormous marketing. And they were all when a new subcategory was formed, mm. uh, like Asahi's Dry or, or uh, um, a few others. and. And then I looked at computers, and it was the same thing. If you look at over 40 years, you look at surges of growth, it was always a new category. It was the, uh, it was, you know, the Sun Microsystem, or it was the Apple. And, and so they always created new subcategories. And then I looked at a dozen other product areas, and it was the same thing. So I, I, I made the assertion that the only way to grow was, uh, to create a whole new subcategory. My brand versus your brand mm. is not, it just almost never results in growth. Mm. And, and this, uh, even this, this has been true forever. You know, it, the, I think the most robust and uh, empirical finding or, or empirical law that we have in marketing, mm. the most accepted, the most studied, is that if you if you try to predict new product success, hmm. there's one variable that stands out, and this has been true for for a hundred years. Hmm. I I used to studies in the fifties that were that showed this, hmm. and and that is the single variable that predicts new product success is how different it is. Hmm. Forever, me too products struggle. Mm. forever mm. so then comes digital mm. and that put this whole phenomenon which has existed forever mm. on steroids because uh, three things uh, appear with digital one is simple technology mm. the internet mm. the iphone the internet of things mm. all those technical things have spawned hundreds of, of extremely successful new subcategory formations. The yeah. second thing is the, uh, the speed. You know, new subcategories, you know, in the case of Japan, four of them in 30 years. But now they come out, you know, twice a year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the, 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 the number, the sheer number of these things that appear that 
you know, Dollar Shave Club started off as a e-commerce shaving thing, and four years later, it was sold for a billion dollars. Mm. I mean, it, it used to take it, it take a long time, and and now it's so fast, and mm. that's because of, e, of e-commerce in in part. <coughs> And then you have the phenomenon of, of a website mm. and social media. Mm. And that has made communication so much different. It used to be that if you want to communicate a whole new a product, it required tens of millions of dollars. It required nine months. You had to create an advertising platform. Then you had to buy ads. Mm. A Dollar Shave Club went on... Uh, created a three-minute video, a three-minute video. And you can go on YouTube and, and look at it. Yeah. It was, it's was extremely funny, very outrageous. <laughs> yeah. It made fun of the big brands. And they got um, 12,000 new customers in two days. Mm. And that started. And you, can't, you couldn't do that 10 yeah. or 20 years ago even. Yeah. So... Uh, so, so that's uh, so. In, in summary, subcategories have been the road, road, uh, the route to growth forever. Mm-hmm. It's not a new thing, but digital put that whole thing on steroids. Right. So, David, what what are the ways that companies can uh, make sure that they are uh, finding subcategories? In your book, you have uh, many examples and many ways that uh, companies can approach this. Uh, would you like to share a few of them? Well, th- there is no simple um, simple rule uh, or, or, or way. First of all, they can come from all sorts of places. Mm-hmm. And uh, they can come from, uh, you know, uh, uh, customer innovations. They can come from technology innovations. So, one of the um, one of the things you have to do is to keep your your uh, your ability to sense what's happening out there, mm-hmm. and uh, it needs to be a, a market sensing. My colleague George Day would wrote books on how you be market sensing a company, mm-hmm. and uh, so that when something happens in the marketplace, the customer is. Uh, is changing in some way, there's a new trend that you understand it and you detect it early. Mm-hmm. But you also have to be on the uh, on the on the, te- the technology side, especially in the digital age. Steve Jobs was really good at that. Mm-hmm. He would wait until the technology was ready mm-hmm. before he came out with the iPod, which appeared two years after um, uh, Sony had Sony, done it, yeah. uh, or the iPad, which appeared two years later after Microsoft had done it. Mm-hmm. But he waited till the technology was right, mm-hmm. and then he did it. And so, you have to understand when technology is emerging and when it's ready. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, or you have to you have to recognize relevant technology and then then improve it so it because it gets ready. You might have to do it yourself. The next challenge is to have an organization that is in place that's able to, to uh, capitalize on it, to be innovative, to be entrepreneurial. And what, what most organizations are really good at is, is uh, operations. Mm-hmm. They get better and better at including marketing and promotions and, and product refinement. They get really good at that. Yeah. And they're staffed with people that are really good at that. And, and the organizational process is not geared to change, strategic change. It's not geared to taking risks. Mm. It's not populated with people that are good at that. Mm. So that's a huge challenge. And, and, and increasingly, companies have to be um, agile. Mm-hmm. They have to be able to do that. So those are really the two challenges. Thank you, uh, David. You know, there, there are a lot of things that are getting talked about. And, uh, you know, uh, once there is buzz, uh, everybody's talking about it. But 
you know once one reads your book or listens to you one realizes that <laughs> there is so much to it there's so much more to it so there is one aspect like that uh, storytelling you know everybody is talking about how we are in the times of story and uh, you know that is what appeals to consumers that is what they retain all of that is being talked about but uh, the way you've approached in your book uh, signature stories you know i i i bought that book also and i am amazed i am so fascinated uh, with how you have holistically in such great detail talked about the many kinds of stories and how it is a strategic asset so when you say uh, david a signature story what do you mean about uh, mean uh, there and why do you say that it is a great strategic asset for communicating strategic messages especially and organizational values well first of all when i started working at stories i got stimulated by my daughter who teaches storytelling at at stanford and we and i wanted her to write a book and she didn't want to write a book so i i did it um but we spent literally a year and a half or two years trying to understand what we meant by stories hmm. because the problem was stories meant almost anything you ask people what's the story of your brand and they will say well it's these four bullet points hmm. you know the, the it's the these terrific attributes that's what my brand is that's my story hmm. well that's uh so so then what it amounts to is the word story is is for everything almost any piece of information can be called a story mm. and so i i kept telling asking uh, my daughter jennifer what is not a story because mm. everything is a story mm. and we literally spent a year a year and a half trying to figure that out and finally we concluded that a story that facts and descriptions are not stories And so what I did was to define a new term which I called signature stories mm. because I wanted to distinguish between the, the between this circumstance that everything is stories mm. to to define signature stories so a signature story has got three attributes mm. one it's got a uh, it's a it's a once upon a time story it's say a chronicle of some sort of event mm. or or uh uh something that happened mm. it's not it's not bullet points of facts or descriptions yeah so if you describe what your organization does or what your product does that is not a story mm. second it's got a wow factor it's not bland and shallow mm. it's something that just pops out at you It's got something that that a lot of people in the audience will say I got to share this. Mm. It is so entertaining, so informative, so weird, so unique, so so uh, intriguing. Yeah. I just have to share it. Yeah. So it's it's got a real power. And the third thing, it's got a, or contributes to a strategic message directly or indirectly. Mm. And uh so it's not just uh fun it, it's got, it's like remember uh in advertising you have these great ads that that at the end nobody remembered what was being advertised mm. it's the same kind of thing in a story you can have a great story that that doesn't leave you with a message mm. now the message can be embedded in the story that's mm. the best thing yeah. but it can also be motivated by the story mm. so you can have a story that motivates you know facts and descriptions then they're something people will pay attention to mm -hmm. so it, but it's, there's got to be a strategic message involved that's what a signature story is amazing and and the, yeah. and the and the reason that it's so powerful especially these days in the digital world where there's there's information overload there's media clutter there's the uh, audience control mm -hmm. it's it's so hard to get mm -hmm. through with a conventional message mm -hmm. And uh, and and one reason is is people uh, counter argue. Mm. They say, yeah, but they're cynical. Mm. So a story gets through. First of all, it gets attention, mm. and and second of all, it you don't counter argue a story. Mm. 
Mm. It's just a story. Yeah. So you don't say, yeah, but yeah, what about this? Maybe you're biased. <laughs> you're trying to sell me something. And it, it's just a story. Yeah, yeah. So it gets through and it gets remembered. Mm. And, there, and, and there's an enormous amount of studies in psychology and communication and in marketing about the truth of that. And, it's, and stories turn out to be more effective than, than facts and descriptions, not by 20%, but by 200%. Uh, wow. Wow. So, so David, uh, um, would you like to name some brands that have done it well? Uh, because uh, the brands that you think are doing a great job of telling their stories. Well, uh, one uh, one I use a lot is that of Lifebuoy Soap, who developed this uh, in India, the Help a Child Reach Five program. Yeah. Mm. And when they put that into three villages in India, <coughs> they they uh, had a, a video team that that told the story of one of the mothers in that village. Mm. And they put that. Uh, uh, those three videos out, they got 44 million views. Mm. 44 million. Mm. This is bar soap. Yeah. So how do you get any kind of uh, interest or viewership if you talk about your bar soap? Mm. Well, you don't. Mm. But if you talk about 2 billion or 2 million kids that under five dying each year, and you have a program that's doing something about that, and then you tell a story about a mother. Yeah. You're not telling. You're not talking statistics. Statistics mm -hmm. is at the end of the video. It's motivated by the video, but you see this mother, and you you cry. Yeah. It, it's so emotional. Yeah. And uh, and you share it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, another uh, company that's really informative is called UC Life. UC stands for the University of Colorado. It's a regional health center in Colorado, in the Colorado area. Mm -hmm. And they tell these enormously powerful stories about patients mm -hmm. and patient history. Mm -hmm. So these stories don't talk about their hospitals. They don't talk about their doctors and how caring and, and, and competent they are. They don't talk about their operating rooms. They talk about patient stories. Mm -hmm. And one was about Becky and she was skiing with her husband on a five-year anniversary at Breckenridge, a ski area, mm -hmm. and she got a, a heart event. Mm -hmm. And she went to their emergency room, and they determined she had a serious heart problem. She was helicoptered to uh, Boulder, where the head for the big hospital of UC Health was. Mm -hmm. and, and it became so serious, she was in bed and could only survive if she got a heart transplant. Mm. And you saw a video of this, and one day a doctor came in and she said, do we have a heart? And he said, yes, we have a heart. Mm. So they had the operation, and, uh, uh, and, and she survived to ski again. Mm. And they did a second video about uh, how she went to knock on the door, of the mother of the heart donor and tell her how, how uh, what that heart is going to do and how much good she's going to do in the world because of that heart. Ah, oh. oh, it's just oh. so emotional. <laughs> and it's yeah. all focused on the patient. Yeah. And, and they have dozens of videos like that. Mm. And they have actually a team of four professionals that are, charged with creating such videos hmm. and and uh that's one of the most impressive uh and so i encourage people to go to uc health and, and look at some of those videos right so very difficult behavioral changes or very strategic messages they're giving by such a human story that uh, there is no counter argument uh, uh, david there used to be times when Grandmothers knew this, and they used to tell stories, planting messages about values and role models to kids before putting them to sleep. And now, you know, in nuclear families and leading individualized lives, but as we are evolving our society, 
are there certain mindsets or talents or skills that will be valued more or have to be cultivated more uh, to be better storytellers well the the real puzzle is uh, why don't people use stories more and uh, well my yeah my focus is on firms organizations yes why don't organizations use it more and i've been uh, you know, it's sort of on a mission to try to get people to use stories more. And I give uh, talks around encouraging, you know, uh, associations of organizations, especially in the nonprofit area, to to try to use stories more. And it's very difficult. It's it's hard to be successful doing that. And there there are a couple of reasons. One is that uh, it's hard to find good stories. Uh, and, and, and actually, one of the uh, areas in which stories are being used is in B2B marketing. Most B2B companies will have hundreds of stories. I mean, my company, Profit, the, the, the consulting company that deals with brand and information or digital transformation issues yeah. and design issues, uh, we, have, we have literally 90 stories that are in a bank. And these stories, almost without exception, are very bland and shallow and boring. They're just watered down. And yet the, the real story behind them is, is can be a lot of tension, excitement, and, and celebrations. Yeah. But you don't hear that in the story. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is I think that in most of these organizations, uh, the the story is about a client or something that is perceived to be a sensitive or maybe is sensitive. They said, please don't, you can't share the details of my story because mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed that we were so screwed up. <laughs> or maybe it's because uh, the solution is is our secret. Yeah. We don't want people to know about it. Yeah. You know, both of which are really stupid mm -hmm. um, inclinations, but but uh, or even worse, the B2B company thinks their client is sensitive mm -hmm. and they want to be careful. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they don't have powerful stories like these stories Lifeboy told or UC Health. It's, it's planned. But the more common thing is they don't have stories at all. They don't find good stories. And, uh, and so it, it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, UC Health, they have people that that, that go to places where doctors hang out. And they, uh, if there's a doctor that looks like he's having a bad day, they ask him why and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or they go up and say, you know, what, what's been your experience in the last week? And, and, and they get them talking. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, it's, uh, not so easy. And, and when an interesting story happens in the organization, then the right people don't know about it. And uh, and people don't don't tell because they don't know there's not a process in place. And the second problem is even when they find a story, even when a good story surfaces and people are talking about it, there's no good mechanism to turn that into a professional video or a professional uh, you know website uh, you know piece of information. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you really need to have access to to professionals. It doesn't have to be inside the organization. It could be outside. But you need to have access to professionals that can really turn that into something. And then you have to have a way to, to present it. You have to have a website that people will come to to see such things. You have to have a way to communicate. This thing exists. Come and watch it or read it. Mm -hmm. uh, you've talked about an organization needs to have a story culture. Um, uh, you know, some of the things you, uh, David, I think mentioned already, but how does an organization build a story culture? Because you, you need to have a culture of storytelling. Now, you can do some artificial things, hmm. like you can demand. Every presentation needs to start with a story. Every meeting has to start with a story. So uh, if, if you don't have a meeting... Unless you say, okay, this is the first five minutes of story time. Let, <laughs> who's got a story? Or if you have a presentation, 
you don't get that if you don't get any podium time unless you start with a story. You must start with a story. And so uh, um, those are some or if you if you have a story, you have ways to celebrate the story. Or you can have a contest. What, what's who comes up with the best customer story this year? Mm-hmm. And everybody has to compete. And the winner gets uh, something of value or, or some prestige of value. Mm-hmm. So, so, I mean, those are the kinds of things you do to build culture. I mean, those kinds of things, they're not just gimmicks. They're, they're the, sort of the bread and butter of culture building. Mm-hmm. Oh, my, my daughter is now on the humor. And she, has, she just gave a TED Talk on humor. And it's the same kind of thing. How do you inject humor into the workforce? Mm-hmm. Because everybody is uh, will accept the fact that if you introduce humor, people are more creative. Mm-hmm. If you introduce humor, the tension drops in the room. Mm-hmm. People uh, uh, don't get angry anymore, yeah. and they get they they just. But how do you how do you get it in there? Yeah. And uh, and and it's the same kind of thing. You. You have to find ways to to celebrate and to make acceptable the uh, telling of stories. So, so David, uh, if I could ask you one more question about uh, brands and stories, uh, because a lot of time advertising agencies, I mean, a lot of time it's looked at as a tactical thing. So there might be tactical uh, ways also how a story can be leveraged. But uh, when a story is at the heart of a brand, you know, like like a Nike or a Tesla, uh, would you say those stories tend to be more archetypal in nature? What yes. I'm talking about when I when I in, uh, define signature stories, yes, it was it was uh, uh, stories that are strategic that are not tactical. So yes. tactical. Stories yeah. are not signature stories. Right. There's yeah. something to make this communication program uh, this quarter effective, yes. to make this ad effective. That's not what a signature story is. Right. It's a story that will have a long life. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned founder stories, like the story of, at High Air, the, the CEO in 1986 that got a sledgehammer out and had his employees on the factory floor destroy 70 defective appliances and said from now on we're not making defective appliances mm. and uh and that story resides in 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 the minds of everybody that works at for hire today there's mm. a the sledgehammers in a museum in, in their home office and mm. and you just have to mention sledgehammer and everybody understands that story and what it means to who the company that's now the largest appliance manufacturer in the world Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and so uh, yeah, that it's been an important symbol of of Hire, an important driver of its culture and its strategy for for thirty five years. I'm sorry, I'm linking this with the fact that uh, consumer generated content and uh, content is becoming uh, you know so uh, important. So are consumers getting to influence a brand? its territory or its evolution much more than earlier? Now, if you go back to subcategory creation, hmm. um, subcategory creation, it really is it, it's about disruptive innovation, which, hmm. which is a topic that's been covered in hundreds of books uh, from Michael Porter on down. But uh, uh, in all of those books, they don't really mention brands. And brand is really uh, the most important or a really critical element of disruptive innovation that's successful because the brand has to do three things. It has to uh, position the subcategory. It has to help scale the subcategory Mm -hmm. by creating a lot of awareness and attention and energy. And third, it has to build barriers Mm -hmm. by branding innovations, by, uh, you know, it's, uh, creating a customer base and so on. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to the first one, it has to position the subcategory. Mm-hmm. Therefore, it has to really basically tell people what's important in this new subcategory. What are the must-haves? What are the two or three things 
you have to do. So that means when customers are going to research the subcategory, they're going to use the positioning that the exemplar brand has made, which is they're going to say, well, I know that these two or three things are the most important things in these new subcategories. That's what I'm going to look for. That's all branding. This is signature rapid fire, most unforgettable travel trip. Well, I went to Japan. I made my first trip to Japan. It was really eye-opening. Okay. Favorite personal possession? Uh, I think I, I really enjoy my house. It's very comfortable. I like my office. I like our garden and so on. Your bestest friend, as they say. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I have I have three, but uh, my wife has about 50, so I envy her. <laughs> okay, <laughs> interesting answer. Alternate profession could have been? You know, I, I really like my profession. I'm so glad I stumbled into it. It was an accident. I, I didn't start out that way, but okay. uh, I was okay. a marketing guy and a in a high-tech company. What would you do on Mars for fun? I wouldn't go to Mars. Oh. I think that's crazy. <laughs> that's just crazy. Um, yeah, some people want to go to Mars. That's dumb. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to Mars. It would okay. be very bad life. Okay. Your most often used phrase. Oh, uh, my daughters uh, tell me that the, my, I, I use uh, too frequently the phrase that it, it's in my book, reads my book. <laughs> Understandably. <laughs> okay. One thing no one knows about you. Well, um, I'm, I'm not as forgetful. I'm not as, uh, as uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't make... Uh, Awkward mistakes as much as people think I do. <laughs> okay. One thing you love about Jennifer. Oh, she's just so so kind and uh, considerate and empathetic. She's the most empathetic person I know. Okay. Uh, your mom's best... She would like me to say that she's the most humorous person I know, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Fine. Uh, your mom's best advice. What was your mom's best advice? I don't think she gave me any good advice. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, David, a book you'd like to gift to all your friends? Well, I, I, a couple of books that, that have influenced me a lot is uh, George Lakoff's book, Is There an Elephant in the Room? He talks about how you frame discussions. And, and uh, I like biographies. And, and uh, Lou Gerstner wrote one, again, also about elephants. Who Said the Elephants Can't Dance? About his turnaround at IBM. Those two books are really, uh, really good, I thought. Okay. What would you tell your 18-year-old self? Just, I guess, be lucky. Be lucky in your career because it's it's mostly luck. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's modest. Um, you, oh, a person who really inspires you. Well, my wife inspires me. My daughters inspire me. I think, um, and. Uh, and professionally, the, the CEO of our company, Profit, inspires me. The dean of the business school, Rich Lyons, uh, inspired me. David, what's next? Well, I'm writing this book on, on uh, applying branding to social programs. Uh, so that'll be, that's going to be my next book. And I, it's almost done and should be out next year. Well, my website is davidocker.com. And uh, so you can get my current thinking at there. Well, I tell you, I think this has been, I've done uh, 
three or four dozen podcasts just in the last year. And, and this has been one of the best ones. You've done a really good job interviewing a lot of uh, good content and, uh, and a lot of energy. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, David. Uh